This is the podcast for the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. I'm Cynthia Graber. It's known that dopamine transmission in the brain, particularly in the frontal lobes, can affect decision-making and can regulate choices when it comes to actions and rewards. But the effect of dopamine transmission in the medial orbital frontal cortex hasn't yet been studied, and dysfunction in that region has been implicated in a variety of mental illnesses, including obsessive-compulsive disorder, certain kinds of depression, and even schizophrenia. And so a team of researchers led by Stan Floresco, professor of psychology at the University of British Columbia, used a rat model to study the effects of dopamine on two receptors in the region D1 and D2. To do so, they trained the rats on two games that involved decision-making, and then they infused drugs, one an agonist and one an antagonist, to the brain region. So how did you go about studying this? What did you have the rats do? What we did is we got rats to play little games of chance. And these games of chance are similar in some degrees to uh, neuropsychological tests that are used with humans. So one test is called a probabilistic learning task where an animal can choose between two different options. And one is more likely to yield reward, like 80% of the time you choose that option, you're going to get that. And the other is you're going to get reward sometimes, but not as often, maybe 20% of the time. And then as a session progresses, these probabilities change. So an animal has to kind of keep track of its reward history. It's like, not just did I get rewarded this time, but how much have I been getting paid over the last little while, over the last few choices? And should I keep doing this or should I do something else? How did the rats respond before the drugs? So the the way that we devise our experiments is we train rats really well. So they're really efficient decision makers. Um, And so by the time we got to testing them, you know, once they noticed that reward probabilities have changed and have changed so that they have to change their behavior, they were really good at switching their behavior and really good at kind of identifying when it was time to change. So they didn't kind of switch too quickly. They switched when it was appropriate to start switching. And after you blocked the receptor? What we found was when we manipulated dopamine transmission just by infusing drugs that are specific to different receptors within the orbital frontal cortex, we could change how animals played this game. And so what we found was when we um, blocked one type of dopamine receptor, the dopamine D1 receptor, they became less efficient at this. They didn't switch as quickly or as often when they should have. When things changed, they weren't as adept. That wasn't the only test you conducted with the rats, right? What else did you have them do? There was a second test that was more like gambling, correct? That's correct. In the first test that I described, it was always, you get something or you get nothing. And there's a probability that you're going to get a a reward or not. Here, now you're choosing between, okay, I can get a small reward for sure, one little sugar pellet, or If I play risky, I might get a larger reward, four times that amount, but I might not get it. And so the probability that the animal is going to get that large reward can vary over session. It changes. And so again, they have to kind of keep track of, so initially the probability of getting that large reward is very high. So there it's, it's better to kind of play risky and choose that big reward. But as the session continues, now the probability gets lower and lower. And now it's like, you know what? Maybe it's better to go for that smaller reward. It's not as big, but I'm more likely to get it. And in the long term, I'm going to get more reward. I'm going to get a higher payout in the long term. In this situation as well, we found that when we blocked D1 receptors, animals were again more sensitive to losses. And here they were less likely to chase after that big reward. They just didn't like losing. It's like once they started losing, even though, hey, it's better for you to play risky here. You're going to get more reward when you block these receptors. Now, you know what? I don't like losing. I'm going to go for the safe bet. So it seems like by inhibiting these receptors, the animals responded in a way that's kind of an analog to human responses to similar tests when they're suffering from particular mental illnesses. But that's not all you found. Uh, Another thing we found that was striking was when we turned up the activity of the D2 receptors. So now we infuse the drug that's overstimulated these receptors. We got market impairments. Animals just were less engaged in the task and were less efficient at playing. And they weren't as optimal in their choice behavior across these two tasks. So it suggests that overactivation of these receptors as may occur under some certain conditions of stress 
may occur in schizophrenia, we're not entirely clear, but certainly excessive activation of these particular types of receptors can also have detrimental effects on this type of decision-making and can also kind of impair motivational functions. What are the implications of this research? What does it contribute to the field? One of the big things is within the, the field of dopamine research, much of that has focused on uh, dopamine transmission and its function in subcortical structures like the striatum. Uh, that is affected in things like Parkinson's disease and maybe affected in schizophrenia as well. And, and a lot of our theories of what dopamine does and how it does it have kind of emerged primarily from studies in this brain region. I think what our data, when you plug it into the other data that are in the field show, is that the principles of operation of how dopamine actually modifies behavior is different in different brain regions. It's not uniform and it can have quite distinct effects. And I guess a secondary thing is that even though dopamine has been implicated in, in motivational processes and kind of initiating response vigor, helping an animal get up and go, helping humans get up and go and do stuff, what we're showing is that, well, too much dopamine or too much activation of one particular type of receptor can actually have detrimental effects on motivation as well. And what are the implications for clinicians? If a drug can pass the blood-brain barrier, would there theoretically be ways to get it to one particular part of the brain? That, it, that really is the holy grail. I think part of this is more, I'm of the opinion, as a, you know, as a preclinical, more basic researcher, is that if we want to fix broken brains, brains that, that have issues with them and psychiatric illness, we, we still need that kind of fundamental data of how the normal brain works and what the kind of normal neurochemical underpinnings are. And so when we see an individual that's suffering with a certain kind of mental illness and we see a certain profile uh, of behavior, this basic research can kind of help us identify, well, what particular system might be targeted? And perhaps we're not at the, at the point yet where we can give a drug that can specifically target a receptor in a particular brain region. But if we can identify kind of maybe pathways after that receptor that may be more selective to the cortex versus subcortical mechanisms, that could be one way that we could kind of normalize transmission in that part of the brain. I think the other thing that we, we kind of get for this is that this particular part of the brain and dopamine transmission in this part of the brain hadn't really been looked at in terms of how that might be involved in both normal and abnormal patterns of behavior. And so this kind of can provide novel insight in terms of, well, this might be another region that we want to kind of understand what it's doing and how it might be dysfunctional in these types of uh, mental illnesses. Where does this research lead? What types of studies do you think need to happen next? What we'd really like to do is to now, now that we have kind of this basic fundamental knowledge is break down this part of the brain, understand the different circuits that may be mediating different, you know, sub patterns of behavior and how dopamine may modulate those particular sub circuits. One way we can distinguish that is by saying, okay, well, what are these different groups of neurons? What are they connected to? What are other parts of the brain that they interface with? And so now we're getting kind of a, a broader understanding of the, the larger neural networks that are involved in different aspects of behavior and how dopamine may modulate one network versus another and the specific receptors that it uses to modulate the activity of that network. This is the podcast for the journal Neuropsychopharmacology. To read the article discussed in the podcast, go to www.nature.com NPP. I'm Cynthia Graber.